With only three episodes left, we are approaching the climax of Star Trek Picard Season 3, and things are moving very quickly. So continue to join us every week as we explore each episode and reveal all the details you may have missed. And please stay tuned to the end to get a special inside look at this episode directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself, so you don't want to miss this episode. A little bend, a little arch, a little antagonizing flair is required. And stay tuned until later where we'll be showing you a futuristic wallet Starfleet would be proud of, even though they don't need money. Once you have their money, you never give it back. Exactly. Last week's episode ended with Geordi and Data being reconnected with the TNG family, and Riker being captured only to find out Vatic already has Deanna. We also learned the thing the Changeling stole from Daystrom Station was Picard's body. With Frontier Day now imminent, what will our old crew do to stop whatever is about to happen and save Will and Deanna at the same time? Picard Season 3 has not only been good Star Trek, but a wonderful look at how our favorite characters have grown over the years as they've aged, and as many of us have also aged right along with them. It's easy to understand why so many of us have strong feelings about the events that they are going through, and as we experience this with them, we also maintain the hope that they will once again save the galaxy. Your hands are stiff, my knees are killing me. So long as we don't have to move or shoot, we should be fine. Some of the things we hope to learn from this episode include why Jean-Luc's body is important to the Changelings, as well as why Vatic is completely obsessed with Jack. And what is Jack's place in all of this? We just love how these episodes begin. The emotions are immediately triggered as we hear a haunting whistling of three blind mice among classic Star Trek sounds, and we find ourselves with the Titan in the Chintoka scrapyard. <laughs> The Chintoka system was the scene of two major confrontations during the Dominion War, the second of which ended disastrously for the Federation, which lost all but one of their 312 allied ships. Being here at the scrapyard is an excellent nod to the events of DS9, which now plays nicely into the Picard Season 3 storyline. I will handle the Jem'Hadar. Who says there's never a Klingon around when you need one? And as we enter the bridge of the Titan, with Seven sitting in the captain's chair, we recognize an old voice that she is talking to. On the view screen is Captain Tuvok, whom we remember best as Star Trek Voyager's science officer, Captain Janeway's confidant, and he played an instrumental role in Seven's development. Tuvok was only the second person after Leonard Nimoy to play a Vulcan as a series regular, and he was fantastic in our opinion. Please go away. Here, Seven is asking Tuvok where Captain Riker is, but he assures her there is no record of him being taken into Starfleet custody. Seven asks if he's been in contact with Captain Janeway, and he tells her she's busy with Frontier Day, which is now only 36 hours away. Seven shares with him what she knows and asks for his help. Seven mentions their games of Kalto, which we saw in a room Seven was in while searching for changelings in episode 4. Tuvok tells her he remembers it well because she often beat him at it. This makes her smile, as it should reveal he is the real Tuvok and not a changeling imposter. And this is why we love Seven. Even though it seems like she can trust him, her instincts make her be more cautious. She offers to meet him at a location she knows a Vulcan would never agree to because of anti kolinar demonstrations. Kolinar is the Vulcan ritual that purges all remaining vestiges of emotions, and Tuvok deeply believes in this. When he agrees, she knows he's an imposter. We get a minuscule smile from the changeling that Tuvok would never show us, and Seven suddenly realizes that because he knows about the Kalto, then he has the real Tuvok. When she demands to know what they've done with him, Plato Tuvok tells her the same thing will do to the rest of you. Death will come as a relief. Suddenly, trackers have been activated to find the Titan, and Geordi and Shaw can't slow them down. Picard demands to know what they've done with Riker, and the Changeling turns into a deathly-looking version of him, and says, I'm as good as dead, just like you. Geordi manages to disconnect the signal in time. It seems hopeless, as Geordi says, Maybe it's time we just accept it. In the operations room, we learn Worf and Rafi are at Exo Port, monitoring Starfleet security, and they confirm there has been no mention of Riker, and they are on their way back to the Titan. Geordi is having a hard time keeping them hidden, and Picard is running out of time to notify Starfleet. Beverly says the Changelings are unique, and maybe they can use that uniqueness against them by finding a tool that will help them root them out. Crusher is concerned about crossing the line, as that could lead to the same virus that nearly destroyed the Great Link at the end of the Dominion War. They're dying. 
You should go to them. Jean-Luc tells her to see what she can find out, and they'll weigh the morality when they get there. We learn Picard is supposed to be participating in Frontier Day, and it requires genetic confirmation of his identity. Geordi says he's afraid the Changelings are trying to use his and Jack's DNA to create a doppelganger of Picard. They need more information, and this leads them back to Data. Alondra has been making progress on Data. They have identified the source of his problem. As they turn him on, he is somewhat the Data we remember. He recognizes they are not on the Enterprise, and asks about the Scimitar, which goes back to when Data was last alive during the events of Nemesis. The Scimitar was Shinzon's warship, as well as a massive Thaleron radiation-based weapon, which Data sacrificed himself to destroy. Shinzon was Picard's clone, which ties nicely to the fears Jordy just mentioned the changelings may be up to. I'm no longer on the Enterprise. The scimitar. That was many, many years ago. Suddenly, Data becomes Lore, who mocks Picard about his age. So the problem is, Data has multiple personalities as he continues to switch back and forth between personas. We learn that Soong and Law are information files, but Data and Lore are partitioned and make up the majority of the positronic brain. But before we explain what this data-lore relationship means, let me quickly tell you about this video sponsor, Exter, who makes what we believe is the best wallet ever created. We just threw away our old wallets. Wanna know why? Because we just discovered the most efficient smart wallet in the world. Exter has revolutionized the wallet and we will never go back to Bifold. We are so impressed. Exter wallets are super slim and sleek. They are half the size of a conventional Bifold wallet. Compact and modular, they hold 12 12 cards or more plus cash. And that means no more stuffing that bulky, worn out bifold wallet into your back pocket. Forget sitting on that uncomfortable lump and slide extra into your front pocket instead. This high quality wallet combines Italian leather, space grade aluminum, and carbon fiber. Plus it includes built-in RFID blocking to protect you from wireless theft. And you know how hard it can be to replace all of your cards if your wallet is stolen. Exter includes a tracking card to help you keep an eye on your belongings with a map, and you can even ring it for location assistance. This is the last wallet you'll ever buy. To get an extra wallet like ours, visit shop.exter.com slash thepopcast. Get 25% off your order when you use code thepopcast at checkout. Join the wallet revolution and upgrade your quality of life with Exter today. So has Lore always been this arch? Did the tree move? Did the apple just fall far from it? All of the personalities inside Data are complicated, but it's his relationship with Lore that has the most effect on him. Jordy explains that Alton Soong was likely hoping the two personalities would merge and create the more human personality that Data always wanted. Maybe an effort to give Data the one thing he always wanted. To be human. Jordy suggests that this data could be the answer the Soongs have been looking to achieve in all their years. But the partition suggests Soong was afraid Lore would consume all aspects of data instead of vice versa. Picard asks Data for help. Data tells him that research indicates an anomalous form inside Jean-Luc Picard. As Data struggles against Lore, Data begs Picard for help, but Jean-Luc couldn't take it and had him turned off. Picard implores Geordi to try and figure out how to restore Data. They know the only way to get Data back may be to remove the partition and take a chance that Lore may take over forever. Help me, Captain. <laughs> Please. On the Shrike, weird demon Vedic hand is back and wants a report from her. We are running out of time. Report. She gives her boss bad news, and he gives her an analogy that Picard and his friends are like one flesh, and you need to separate the flesh to defeat them. He once again tells her that they must have the boy. A frustrated Vatic stews in her chair as we now go over to Jack in the Titan turbo lift, and we hear a woman's voice that says, let me connect us. He is there with Sydney. Jack asks her about her quarters, and she says she's an ensign and they're small. Jack begins to hear Sydney's voice as she wonders if he is flirting and that she finds him charming. He touches her hand as that's exactly what she's thinking, and it unsettles her. Why did you do that? When she asks why he did it, his eyes turn red, and we can see the vines coming in the background. Now on the bridge, this is exactly why we love Star Trek so much. 
they get a signal from Starfleet with a compromised prefix code. It's a signal coming from the Shrike that lets other Starfleet ships know they have been compromised. They now know Vatic has Riker. Jack wants to talk to his father, and he says he doesn't know what's going on with him. He feels like he is getting everyone in trouble, and he wants to trade himself for Riker. He says he's always felt different, like there is something wrong with him deep inside, and it's like he can hear his own head. Picard tries to tell him he doesn't deserve what's happening to him, and then Picard suddenly has a plan to get Vatic. Now out in open space, the Shrike finds the Titan, but it looks like it has been damaged. Vatic finds a subspace message that says the Titan is dead in the water. She boards the Titan with the crew of her bird-faced underlings, and she finds Jack in the corridor. I thought you'd be taller. Such a fantastic line. She tells him she wants to take him to a better place. He tells her she'll have to catch him first. The Titan crew lay a trap as force fields start trapping Vatic's people, and then suddenly Jack and Sydney find themselves trapped together and surrounded by Vatic's men. But the transporter is offline for some reason, and they can't beam Jack and Sydney out. It appears Lore has control of the transporters. Beverly now confronts Vatic alone with her phaser, and she looks like a mama bear about to do some damage. Picard shows up to join the interrogation. Vatic asks them if they know about their son's physiology, and insists Jack's not for her, but he is not for them either. Picard assures her she's trapped, and when he brings up the Dominion War, she gets angry. Beverly tells Vatic the Changeling started it, but she tells her no, it's the Solids were coming, and they ruin every world they touch. They had no choice but to stop them. She then says the Federation destroyed her home. Picard says they created a cure for the virus, but then Vatic reminds him the Federation voted not to give it to the Changelings and that one of her own had to steal it. She must be referring to Odo receiving the cure from Bashir before bringing it back to the Great Link. We also find out here that the new ability of the Changelings came from Starfleet. It's the thing that allows them to hold their form and pass every test. We then cut to Geordi, who explains Lore is taking over all systems because he loves the chaos, and Jack and Sydney are suddenly in danger because the force fields are failing and the bird changelings will reach them. Then we realize that Sydney may actually be in danger from Jack as his eyes start to glow red. Back with Vatic, Picard, and Beverly, we learned that her and nine other changelings had been prisoners of war at Daystrom Station. It was called Project Proteus. They had been conducting tests on the changelings. We learned that Vatic took the form of the woman who inflicted her with pain, more pain than any being should be able to endure. She said they wanted to turn them into weapons, perfect, undetectable spies who could drop into any species and spread chaos. This created the perfect monster, she said, and that is who they are now. Picard tells her he didn't know, and Vatic taunts them. Federation took my family. Now I will take yours. Come on, Section 31. What are you guys doing, huh? Very powerful. Beverly says Vatic is too calm and too confident. She wants to know why she took the face of her torturer, and Picard tells her to remind herself of her hate. Picard pulls his phaser out as he and Beverly talk about the possibility of killing Vatic. On the other side of the ship, Geordi is doing everything he can to get past Lore and reach Data. He tells Data that he made him a better man and how it nearly killed him when he died. The scene is very touching and very moving. Not only is Geordi opening up his heart to Data, but he's trying to save his daughter as well. Back with Beverly and Picard, Crusher says she is losing her compass as she thinks the only way to save her son is for Vatic to die. Back with Geordi, Lore tells him he is going to level the playing field and he drops all the force fields. Picard and Beverly try to shoot Vatic, but she escapes. Jack and Sydney are separated and Jack can't get to her to help her. Jack's eyes turn red as somehow he takes control of Sydney and helps her fight the changeling. Geordi, desperate, finally reaches Data as Lore is pushed aside. Beverly gets the information on Project Proteus, and they learn each of the Changelings have a stabilizing agent that can be tracked. The Changelings take the bridge, and Vatic is now in control of everything. She addresses the ship and notifies the crew that she'll be taking Jack Crusher where he belongs as she anoints herself Captain of the USS Titan, and that Jack will learn who he truly is. Showrunner Terry Metalis and his whole writing team have done an amazing job this season, and this episode by Jane Mags is just another feather in the hat of Picard Season 3. Vatic instantly transforms from a mustache-twirling villain to a complex character whose motivations finally make sense. Her thin grasp on reality is now fully fleshed. 
pun intended, and we can sympathize with her story even while we root against her. Jordy's heartfelt pleas to reach Data through lore were heart-wrenching and probably LeVar Burton's best acting since Roots. The next level acting of each of our long-term TNG friends shows decades of experience and maturity. We did not get Worf, Riker, Deanna, or Rafi this episode, but they didn't feel lost as Beverly, Jean-Luc, Jordy, Data, Lore, and Vatic lit up the episode. Now with Vatic in control, what does this mean for the crew of the Titan, and what does it mean for Jack? There are still many questions left unanswered. What is Jack's role in all of this? How can Vatic reveal who he really is? Will Worf and Rafi show up and save the team, or is this the end and the Changelings win? Who will win the battle over the new android, Data, or Lore? And did you love Episode 7? If so, give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing as we'll be doing this every week. And stay tuned because in a moment, we are going to share with you thoughts on Episode 7 directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself. But first, what do you think? Did you find yourself feeling sympathetic for Vatic's story, or was it Jordy telling Data how he felt that really got to your heart? Tell us what you think, and let's talk about it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to hear more discussions about this topic and others like it, please join us over at our other channel, The Popcast Unleashed, where we'll be conducting interviews with your favorite Star Trek personalities. Also, please consider supporting the channel and get your own Data-inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at Mixtees.com. Get 20% off your purchase just by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. And now, Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner, Terry Metalis. Certainly after Nemesis, it was clear that Data copied everything over onto B4, and it was unrecoverable, it didn't work. But technology now is at a point where it might. Certainly, his, it had worked by the end of season one, it was recoverable in some way. Uh, so the idea that Alton Soon would possibly try again to succeed in his father's footsteps, um, to create the last perfect legacy Soon android, to be the most human, meant uh, to have data as the primary operating system, but to have some lore, to have a law, to have all these other components that, that would that would humanize um, that synthetic android. But he died before he got to make it work. So you have this schizophrenic Frankenstein incomplete monster um, now with these personalities at odds. And when we pitched it to Brent, the, the idea of multiple personalities, Jekyll and Hyde, it's it's just a thrilling thing for an actor to be able to play. Yeah, what was his response to doing that? He loved it. He loved it because, we, you know, within, you know, five seconds, he gets to play both Data, Lore, and, and everything else in between. Um, and it promises a kind of final Data story and a kind of final lore story, which is also, lore was shut down and archived, but there are, uh, there's, there's more to it. So I need you to listen to me because life rarely gives you second chances to say what you should.